people in senior management uh, acting um, for an extended uh, period and some uh, going beyond, even going beyond the age of, uh, of, 60, of 60 years. And uh, so following that um, uh, engagement with, uh, I mean, that statement, um, we um, subsequently received uh, some, um, you know, um, presentation um, from the Defense Service uh, Commission where the issue of uh, career management within the SNDF uh, was uh, raised uh, as a, a, a challenge. But we thought in this meeting, we must invite the Defense Service uh, Commission uh, to come and um, <coughs> to, we must invite them that, to come and um, uh, talk to us uh, about uh, their own observation. Um, even when we went on tours, I think in Cape Town, um, we also received complaints from the members of the SNTF um, who had remained uh, in the same uh, in the same rank. Um, and their life has not uh, improved uh, uh, since then. And they were worried that they were very close to the age of retirement. And yet they, uh, they, they don't see much prospects um, beyond um, retirement when they are still sitting um, in the ranks that they were uh, still uh, occupying. And uh, well, and there was a discussion at some point. Um, I think a recommendation was made, I think uh, by the Defense Service Commission and the uh, Admiral Kugu uh, also touched on it at some point. And uh, uh, the talk of uh, delinking um, uh, salary uh, from rank, and it was prompted about the 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 the, the upward mobility uh, that was starting to become a, an issue of concern, mainly um, <clears throat> among the 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 rank and file of the, of the soldiers. Uh, <clears throat> so we thought today we should invite the, the, the Defense Force uh, Service Commission um, to talk to us when we discuss this issue of uh, uh, succession uh, planning. I'm happy that they've uh, accepted the inv invitation and uh, they are in this meeting. Um, the delegation list uh, has been shared with me. Um, it's, it's the, the, they are led by their own chairperson, uh, Mr. Robinson, and he will then introduce uh, the other members of the, the commission. Uh, but the, the list appears to include all um, uh, nine commis commissioners, uh, including himself, and um, plus the key members of staff um, from the commission itself. So, but uh, as to where exactly is in the meeting, I'll leave that to Mr. Robinson or rather who exactly has been able to attend from his side, I will leave that to Mr. Robinson. We thought we should also extend it to the two uh, panelists, um, uh, 
these are not um, uh, you know they they need no introduction because um, they have been in all the the the, the workshops uh, uh, or forums where we invited the experts to come and uh, talk uh, to us. Uh, some of them have been part of the, the panel of the, the discuss, discussions uh, in uh, some of those um, uh, forums. Uh, here I mentioned the name of uh, Professor uh, uh, Sam uh, Zetra. Uh, Dean, uh, Faculty of uh, Military uh, Science, um, uh, and Dr. Moses uh, B. Uh, Kanyele, who is director for, uh, sorry, the director uh, in the Center for Military uh, Studies. And uh, so these two colleagues, uh, I consider them uh, a resident um, experts because we found them <clears throat> already uh, involved in matters uh, defense so they can share with us uh, their own observations as well um, but I must also indicate that um, in the meeting uh, the chief of staff um, <clears throat> Uh, Lieutenant uh, General Yam. Uh, it will be present. Uh, <clears throat> so it's going to be a, a fly, a fly on the wall. Um, yeah, I really appreciate uh, his, his his attendance. His participation, even though not active so much, uh, because um, uh, the, the matters that get discussed in this forum are then taken, uh, taken up uh, in follow up uh, discussions uh, with the uh, department. So I'm sure this will also give him. And, and his team an opportunity to uh, uh, identify gaps uh, in the presentations so we're going to be receiving this uh, afternoon and uh, uh, to help them uh, uh, prepare uh, when we meet with them at, at some point in, in, in time. And it will give them the opportunity to plug the gaps and actually extend even more um, or elaborate even more on the presentation uh, tonight. They would know areas covered, they would know uh, how much um, the committee has been able to, to be, has been, was able to be exposed to and then uh, take it up uh, from there. I really appreciate um, uh, the presence of uh, uh, General, uh, General, the Chief of Staff, General Yam. And uh, Admiral uh, Kubu, a good friend of the, the another good friend of the committee, I'm saying this uh, in, on, on a lighter note. Um, it's been very helpful and has assisted the committee in um, navigating through some uh, difficult uh, matters on the HR side um, and made us understand, um, you know, or even wiser on, on, on some of the, the, the issues. I appreciate that uh, um, uh, Admiral Kubu uh, is also uh, in this meeting. And uh, <clears throat> So uh, I, 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 the participation colleagues, it's going to be free. It's a no holds bar uh, a discussion. And um, so, uh, so that um, we enable 
um, the flow uh, and, and, and the uh, seamless exchange of, um, of notes uh, because we come from uh, different areas of, of, the, of, of deployment. And um, <clears throat> in the process, we've been able to make certain observations that you may want to pass to the committee or share with us. We we'll then engage uh, with those. So uh, uh, essentially, uh, I, I wished to acknowledge uh, and welcome the Defense Service Commission, uh, Mr. Robinson and, and, and the other commissioners. And also, I also welcome uh, Professor Tsaita uh, and uh, Dr. Kanyele. Uh, and I also uh, welcome especially um, uh, the Chief of Staff, uh, Admiral Kubu, and the other members of the senior members of the Defense Force that I cannot uh, recognize um, uh, on the platform. And uh, once again, I mentioned that it's, uh, the, uh, it's a no holds barred discussion and it's open to all of us uh, to engage uh, with the issues. Mine is just to facilitate. So <clears throat> colleagues, um, that is the, the opening, the discussion, what to call uh, <clears throat> the papers of uh, uh, the, our uh, meeting uh, or this discussion uh, today. Uh, well, the agenda, um, uh, just a, a rough agenda that um, we will follow. Uh, we'll start with the Defense uh, Service uh, Commission, um, then uh, present. Uh, oh, uh, the minister has joined uh, the meeting. I hear from the colleague um, that the minister is... Uh, oh. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister, for, 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 for this, uh, for joining in. So, uh, Sir, I, I yes. joined in, but my, um, my power can go off any time. So I actually registered to say, if I was expected, please accept that I, I have any yeah, yeah. problems today. So I might not oh. be long. If I'm okay. off, Please understand we'll, that. No, no, we'll understand it, Minister. I appreciate your, your, your presence. I'm sure all members of the committee do. Thank you um, very much. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. And uh, <clears throat> so it's Defense Service Commission, as I said, uh, followed by the, uh, sorry, I'm looking for this note from Landipa. Uh, Uh, followed by the presentation uh, by the two panelists, um, one after the other. Maybe uh, they'll decide who uh, goes in first. And then after all three have presented, we'll then take um, a, a discussion on, on what would, be, would have been presented. So without much ado, um, colleagues, uh, are there any apologies to note uh, tonight? Um, good evening, Chair. Good evening to the Minister and to all members. There are no apologies, Chair. And um, just a correction, Chair. Um, there's only one presentation from both, from the doctor and from the professor. It's only one pre presentation from both of them. Thank you, Chair. No, no, no. That, that is perfect. That is perfect. All right. So uh, may I now uh, invite uh, Mr. Robinson uh, who would start uh, by introducing uh, his uh, members who are on the platform and then launch into uh, his presentation. Uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Chair. That, that, thanks, thanks very much. Um, 
Good evening, uh, Chair. Good evening, members of the committee. Good evening, Minister. Let's hope you're able to stay for some time in the discussion. It should be a useful one. With me, I have, I think it's uh, myself and three other commissioners. We have the Deputy Chair. I think they can introduce themselves and two others. So there's four out of seven commissioners present. And we also have uh, three or four members of the Secretariat um, who are going to listen. And uh, uh, Mr. Magabani, Tabo Magabani, one of our researchers, is uh, going to make the presentation on behalf of the Commission. But once again, I welcome this opportunity, Chair. I think uh, the discussion should be fruitful. As you said, no holds barred. Uh, and uh, none of us hold a monopoly on uh, understanding of these issues. So uh, from our side, once again, thanks for the invitation. Um, I don't know if the other commissioners want to in introduce themselves before I ask uh, Mr. Magubani to uh, uh, present for us. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. My name is Sibina Shapolosa. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much and welcome, Deputy Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. My name is Pelle Zulu. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. My name is Salome Magilane. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Magilane. And welcome. Thank you. Right. My name is Kumalo. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome, uh, Ms. Kumalo. That, thank, thanks very much, uh, the commissioners. Can I ask uh, Tabo Magabani uh, if he can flight the presentation? And uh, he's uh, one of the researchers in the commission. Um, so he will take us through the presentation. Thanks, Mr. Magabani. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, honorable members. I, I'm just not too sure who's going to flight it. Is it going to be flighted from your side because we sent it, or should I be given permission to fly from this end? Um, yes. I have given you the permission. You are the co-host. OK, thank you. I will fly it now. Um, I said uh, Ms. Noguzola Kumado is advocate uh, Noguzola Kumado. I also said uh, Ms. Uh, Pelele, sorry, Dr. I said Pelele Zulu, uh, Makeba, Dr. Mr. Pelele Zulu is Dr. Uh, Pelele Zulu. I just said that to uh, uh, flag that. All right, uh, Tabo, over to you. Uh, thank you again, Chair. Uh, in terms of our discussion, we will cover briefly the introduction as well as our recommendations as requested by the committee around which, which have been submitted, which were submitted to the Office of the Minister on Career Management. We'll also touch on a recommendation which we've made on succession planning. And then obviously that would be, that's what basically our, I mean, our presentation would cover. Now, um, just briefly, uh, I think the, the chair has, has covered the, the, the part about the invitation and what we were requested to present on. What probably uh, was not made away is that um, at the time in 2021, 2022 financial year, the commission had set out to actually uh, submit a recommendation to the minister on succession planning in the SNDM. So, we believe that probably sharing our findings as well as what we found in that particular exercise in this particular presentation uh, would also be fruitful. 
And this particular, uh, we must note that this particular uh, recommendation was submitted to the Office of the Minister uh, uh, on the 20th of May, 2022. Now, we will start off, as, I, as we indicated in our introduction, we'll start off with the issues surrounding career management. Now, some of uh, uh, from from the interim uh, commission up until, the, I mean, even later, the current commission, we've made numerous findings and recommendations on the challenges which are facing the SNDF with regards to career management. And from the commission side, uh, the current commission side, all, all of these uh, particular challenges, or we, we met up with most of these complaints and challenges from members when we did consultative visits. Because uh, even if you were to go to a to any visit report that we've written around uh, the consultative visits, you will find complaints from the members on career management. And some of those findings and recommendations, we've highlighted a few, there's quite a number of them, but we've highlighted a few in this particular presentation. Uh, some, some of these findings was that uh, the career management uh, is non-existent in the SANTF. Uh, the senior, senior and staff positions were meant by reserve force members in particular units. So you found that uh, posts which should, should have been occupied by, by, by permanent uh, members were, were meant by reserve force members. Uh, and members, um, some members were not considered for promotions, even though they were they had attended all of the required courses as well as spent or served the required years of service in rank. So these were just some of the issues that we had found, and some of, uh, of these members felt that this was uh, the, there was a bit of uh, unfair discrimination which was uh, muted against them. Now, in terms of our recommendations to these issues, uh, well, they also covered around issues of. Uh, that the SNTF should review the career management system um, and making sure that um, uh, the senior vacant posts are staffed by permanent members uh, to ensure command and control continuity and proper strategic planning. Some of these issues also, <clears throat> we, we also did recommend that there should be a fair and transparent uh, implementation of policies. There were some members raised that what is contained in the policy and what is implemented by the department are two different things. Uh, in continuing with that is that uh, some members also complained that they were placed on promotional posts, but were never attend, um, were never offered the opportunity to attend the required military uh, courses, which would allow them to actually be eligible for promotion. Um, we, we made a con uh, we also made a recommendation with regards to that in in, in the sense that uh, the selection and nomination criteria for members to attend the JSC uh, and and staff program be revised so that successful learners can add value to the to the SNDF, as well as issues around qualification, experience, and seniority uh, not being considered during staff and placement. Some members felt that uh, when promotions or uh, promotions are, are done, in certain instances, uh, the issues around qualification, experience, and seniority were, were not considered by those who were responsible for that particular part of the promotion. And we also made a recommendation in that regard. Now, we, we, we just covered basically the brief issues around uh, career management, because some of these issues are also touched on, on in our second, because we're starting the second part of our conversation or our presentation, which is on the recommendation that we've made on succession planning. So as I indicated earlier on in our introduction, that, um, we had set out as, a, as, as the DFSC to actually come uh, make a recommendation to the minister of a particular issue. And primarily some of these issues uh, arose from what members actually raised around the concerns uh, of career management in terms of it being uh, <clears throat> not, I mean, with the challenges that the career management system was experiencing. So in doing so, we found that uh, when going through the different document, uh, documents within the, the, the SNDF, there, are, there, there seems to be different interpretations of what succession planning was. Uh, so our understanding uh, our, our understanding and, our, and the premise that we worked with is that succession planning is a continuous and systematic effort um, to support institutional stability through 
was you need to uh, do the identification development of the correct employees, or in this case, correct members to occupy critical positions when they become vacant. Now, one of the other things probably which uh, we also wanted to highlight because uh, we also engaged with some members, uh, senior members within the SANDF around the issue of succession planning. And obviously the issue of members feeling that this would be a, 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 some, it might be misinterpreted as a pre-selection exercise. So what, what we also wanted to bring across is that succession, succession planning is not a pre-selection exercise. However, it is a, a preparation exercise where we, we prepare and create a pool of suitably qualified and capable members to take up leadership and critical positions when they do become vacant. So one of the other observations of the uh, DFSC is that between 2018 and 2021, um, there seems to be a, um, an increase uh, in the number of senior members uh, occupying critical positions uh, beyond the compulsory age of uh, uh, six, retirement age of 60. Now, some of these some of these examples that we've cited, there are, there, there, there are numerous examples, but we just cited a few to, to just highlight the point that we made in the previous slide. To say the, the former chief SANDF um, uh, also uh, um, was, was in employment or was contacted uh, beyond 60 years of age, as well as the former chief SANDF, I mean, CHR, as well as our current uh, chief of uh, SANDF. Uh, with, with the information that, that we have is that he's already passed uh, the age of 60. Now, according to some of the information which we obtained from CETA uh, in February, is that the, the SNDF has 10 generals who have, in total, they have 10 generals who have, um, actually, who are above the retirement age of 60. However, we must, we must uh, explain that we do, we do understand that there are certain generals, for example, who, who would be placed in the structure of the SNDF but we were just interpreting this in that sense to say, with what with the information that we received, ten generals within within that environment, I mean, sorry, within the SANDF are over the age of sixty. Now, from that information that we got, we found that ninety-seven of these generals, I mean, ninety-seven uh, of the generals, are between the ages of fifty-five and sixty, which means that within and within the next five years, ninety-seven of the current generals would have left. Uh, under normal attrition, which is uh, retirement, when they reach, or they would have reached the age of 60 in this case, because we cannot, we can no longer uh, guarantee that by 60 they would have left, uh, given the current trend. So now these statistics uh, imply that the SNDF will lose 107 uh, uh, senior members or general staff by 2027 uh, due to normal attrition or retirement. Now, the 107 members that we are referring to, they constitute 48% of, of senior members or of the general staff. So by 2027, we would have lost uh, close to half of the current uh, uh, senior members or general staff that we have. Now, of concern to the DFSC is that the exit of these members, if it's not managed properly, may result in a drain of experience and knowledge from the department, which would affect, I mean, which could uh, would or could affect the operational capabilities of the SNDF. Now, the DFSC was concerned with the realities presented above and agreed to examine the topic of succession planning, as I had indicated uh, previously. Now, we just, because of the time allocated for the presentation, we're just highlighting on these issues that we found. Now, one of the other things which is now we are circling back to career management. Succession planning in itself cannot function or cannot be, cannot be implemented in a vacuum. It requires other foundational human resource components to be in place and functioning before it can be successfully implemented. Now, these, com uh, these uh, components include talent management, career management, training and development, and performance, and, uh, performance management. And all of these components that the DFSC has touched uh, on them, or, uh, I mean, in our recommendations in terms of um, the, D, the D, sorry, uh, in terms of the SNDF uh, fixing the challenges 
which have been cited in those particular uh, components. Now, we also looked at what, what probably the, the SNDF could benefit by implementing a succession planning, and that it would ensure uh, leadership and organizational continuity because uh, it will also help identify skills gap to actually know that the current, whether the current leadership or the pool of potential leadership uh, members uh, have any skills gap that need to be actually uh, corrected before they actually reach the, the leadership position. So it will also assist in retaining uh, institutional uh, knowledge. Uh, there's also an issue around uh, boosting the morale and retention of, of, of the members and replacing highly, uh, highly specialized competencies within the department. Now, we didn't also look at uh, the benefits. We also looked at what, what are the risks of, or that the SNDF could face if they do not actually implement succession planning. Some of it is that uh, some of these challenges or the risks that the SNDF might be exposed to um, relate to the SNDF's ability to execute its constitutional mandate the threat to organizational con uh, continuity, prolonged vacancies and acting capacities, which is something that is currently happening in terms of what we found. There are prolonged vacancies and acting capacities. And again, given on when the post became vacant, those uh, certain environments experience those more than others. Now, uh, there's also a, a risk of uh, the loss of expertise and organizational knowledge, uh, as well as leadership gaps. Uh, we also, the SNDF also runs a risk of promoting unprepared successors to, to key leadership and critical positions, which, which would uh, in, inevitably um, result in, in, in the, uh, for lack of a better word, a disaster for the department. Now, the lost, again, the lost time, there will be lost time due to the increased learning curve for incumbents. So if, 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 the, if these members or potential leaders are not properly skilled and trained, the time it would take them to be fully functional within the, the respective positions they might be uh, promoted to might be longer because of the, of, the, of the time it will take for them to actually gain the required skills and competences required for those specific uh, positions. Now, the risk, Again, there's also a risk to say that the, the morale of the members might be affected due to uh, uncertainty in terms of leadership positions. Now, in, in, our, in, our, in our recommendation that we had sent to, or that we sent to the minister, what we had covered, uh, we, we covered uh, around, I mean, the issues that uh, we recommended that the SNDF or the DOT must design because we found we also found that there was no succession planning in place. However, there were uh, chief of human resource administrative instructions which were used. And again, this obviously it, it would be a longer discussion in terms of what they then uh, what they then define as succession planning. Whereas in actual fact, we the TFSC holds a different view in terms of what what that particular process was. So they use administrative uh, instructions to staff senior positions uh, as opposed to having a policy on succession planning. Now, what we recommended is that they, uh, the, the, SNDS, the SNDF or the DOD should, I mean, must design and implement succession planning, which will seek amongst others to ensure organizational continuity, fairness and the development of potential candidates. Uh, and, once that is done, they must then it, it will actually then re require that uh, the SNDF must review and amend the chief uh, human resource administrative instruction so that it is in line with the, with the developed policy on succession planning or the policy to be developed on succession planning. Now, one of the other issues that we picked up uh, is that when we consulted the members is that uh, members are always in the dark when it comes to promotion even the ones who are affected by the promotions themselves. Uh, uh, to such an extent that one members to say, one member indicated that they, they usually also find out about the same time when everyone else find out that they are probably been promoted or been transferred to another environment. So what we recommended in this, in this case, we, we recommended that there should be consultation with these members before uh, these decisions are made, and, and and this also talks to 
what actually succession planning seeks to achieve in terms of development of potential candidates. You cannot develop a person who um, has no idea that they, they, they are being considered for, for, for a career pathing or succession planning to a senior position. Or alternatively, the issue of consulting will also help in, in determining whether the member actually wants it is part of their career plan or career aspirations to actually go that particular route. So we felt that the issue on uh, member consultations or member engagement should also be included in that particular post, uh, in that particular uh, policy to be drafted. Uh, and we, we, we emphasize that the concept of preparation and not pre-selection must be reinforced so, that, so as to minimize disgruntlement and grievances at a later stage. And, and one, of, what, one, one, of the, one of the other recommendations was we made is that for this particular policy or the succession planning to be effective, as we indicated earlier on in our presentation, succession planning does not function in a vacuum. So what is then required is that what we recommended in this regard is that the SNDF should attend to the challenges in, which have been experienced with performance management, career management, talent, talent management, training and development agently, because they can develop a policy, but if these particular uh, subcomponents or functions within HR are not functional and uh, properly functional, it will mean also this particular succession planning would fail. So, um, the last part just talks to issues around time frames and uh, for monitoring and evaluation purposes. And that brings us to the end of, the, of our presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tabo, uh, for this. Thank you. Uh, presentation, very clear and, and straightforward. And uh, at least uh, it, it covers issues that are still fresh uh, in your mind. Uh, from your investigation, uh, which uh, included interacting with the affected uh, individuals and uh, the rank and file, we, we, we are really grateful. But what scares me is, is what you've just mentioned that uh, uh, by 2027, uh, the SNDF we lose about, um, would have lost about 107 uh, generals uh, through uh, a natural uh, attrition. Uh, that is based on the fact that uh, 10 generals are already above the age of 60, and that um, 97 generals are between the age. Um, 55, the age is 55 uh, and, and 60. And they're saying that uh, an unmanaged exit of members may result in the, in the organization uh, losing uh, experience uh, and, and institutional uh, memory. And um, we also highlight uh, the benefits for managing uh, uh, you know, a clear uh, succession plan. And um, uh, you also uh, highlight the risk attendant to not, um, uh, you know, doing, doing that. And, and that in your view, they, they, there does not seem to be any succession plan within, within uh, the department or the organization save for what is described as uh, a chief HR uh, administrative instructions. And, and then you've made a specific recommendations uh, to, to the minister. Uh, that is what uh, amongst other things uh, I picked up. Um, and you also made a good point, uh, uh, Defense Service Commission, that um, you know, a succession, a succession plan is not a pre-selection exercise, but a, a preparatory uh, exercise. Right, uh, colleagues, um, I thought I would just uh, uh, summarize what was said. 
without mentioning everything that the, the, the table on behalf of the commission uh, raised. And uh, <clears throat> okay, let me now invite uh, the two panelists uh, who have uh, made uh, a joint uh, a presentation uh, tonight uh, to talk to their presentation. And uh, Professor Sam Settler, Dean uh, Faculty of Military uh, Science based in uh, Stellenbosch University, uh, and the head of the Military Academy there, and uh, Moses B. Uh, Kanyele, uh, Center for Military Studies Director, he is also a member of the ENDIC, uh, is involved in the defense uh, industry. All right, colleagues, uh, they need no introduction. They have been before us before. Uh, over to you, colleagues, the two of you. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, the Honorable. I, I hope I'm audible on the other side. Yes, you are off. Uh, thank you, you very much. Uh, like the, the, the Honorable has already indicated, I'm Professor Sam Tsefa. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Community Science. With me is my colleague, Dr. Moses Kanyele, that I has indicated he, he need no, he doesn't need any introduction. Let me also pass the greetings to the Honorable Minister and uh, to you, Chair of the, the Joint Standing Committee on Defense and your colleagues and uh, the delegation from the Defense HQ in the form of the Chief of Staff, CHR, and their colleagues present on board, and then also our colleagues from the Defense Force Service Commission. And thank you for the presentation. Oftentimes, and of course, as academics, we, we tend to theorize a lot. And uh, that's basically what uh, you're going to basically see from our presentation. We are going to simply share our perspective of what we observe as a, a, a this topic on, on, on the issues of uh, uh, succession planning. Now, with that said, we basically come in to share our perspective uh, as, as academics, and then you will see that our presentation will uh, dovetail well with what Mr. Magubane has already uh, indicated, but we basically come in from the, the, the theoretical side, and then, of course, we will quote one or two uh, 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 textbooks in that regard. With regards to our scope, um, we will give the, con the context concept around uh, succession planning and the, the rationale, why it's done, and some of the symptoms of inadequate succession planning. And I think in that line, you, you are going to see that uh, the presentation uh, uh, is in hand in hand with what has been presented earlier on. And then we also touch on what is done on the private sector. And then of course, what are the lessons that we can bring to the table from the private sector to the government sector? And then how is this succession plan, uh, planning done from the other side? And then of course, we will come to the SNDF uh, perspective with regards to uh, uh, succession planning, and then we'll get to the conclusion. At some stage, I will stop talking, and Dr. Kanyile, we have actually, we are going to share the presentation as, as a collective. Now, we start with basically, what are these concepts of uh, succession planning? And uh, succession planning simply means the steps that are taken to identify which roles are important in a company or uh, and which potential candidates could become successor for those roles. And then, of course, again, the succession planning involves ensuring that your successors are prepared for the handover and making sure that they have the required training skills and experience to fulfill the role. Mainly, mainly in that in that space is basically we, 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 we want to emphasize the issue of the fact that we, we need to really get the right guys on board. And I think uh, uh, if you listen to Mr. Magubani, he has highlighted some of these key points that we, we put seven points currently. Organizations at large, they aspire to acquire and develop and retain and ultimately promote top, top talent. And, and, and then of course, successful organizations rely on high caliber leadership for high performance on continuous basis. Transition between leadership is based on careful succession planning. It's essentially mainly getting the right guys into the bus and then of course the wrong guys off the bus. 
and and of course in that you must make sure that you allocate the seats accordingly that's what you get in literature from time to time uh, top talent can be sourced from inside or outside the, the organization of course the exception is with the military because that's a different ball game on its own uh, you need a particular trait to be in the military you can't be sourced on the street to come in and and perform effectively in the military largely because i said it's a, it's, it's a different trait orderly leadership succession ensures stability predictability known leadership qualities including areas of develop development and this is a responsibility of oversight and exec executing authorities in most cases and then of course uh, in, in in the private sector they rely on the board to do that now why is this done and i think largely what uh, mr maguban highlighted earlier on this must be done in an od orderly transition of leadership and you do that to avoid leadership vacuum and ensures continuity of the mission or service delivery without disruption. Therefore, it must be done properly without bias, fear, favor, or prejudice. And it must be done by recognizing the primacy of the interest of the organization, not of individuals within the organization. Talent retention and strategy, uh, strategic fit should guide the succession planning. And these are some of the, 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 the rationale that in most cases succession, succession planning is done. Now, I think um, the biggest challenge we, we have is we have the ability to identify some of the symptoms of uh, inadequate succession planning. One key element that we can point out is vacancies for a long period. And then I think this is one of the challenges that we, we might be having here within the DOT. And then of course there is a, a, the current leadership trying to work on that. And then leaders in acting capacity. And then I think in that it leads to long-term decision and commitments that are not made. And then ultimately then you have organization and paralysis in decision making process largely because when these guys are acting uh, you are not too sure whether tomorrow you'll be acting or somebody new is coming and then of course we start to rely on on, on hesitancy and, and, and non-committal non to, to, to crucial matters within uh, uh, the organization incidents of non-compliance with re regulatory and governance framework increases and disregard, disregard age limit, irregular uh, uh, extension of employment contracts. Those are some of the symptoms that you always see in an organization once you are, you are, you are, you are having challenges with regards to the succession planning. Organizations seem to be on autopilot and, uh, you know, is directionless and lack of accountability. And largely because if these guys are acting, uh, they don't have actually the authority to take a, a decision. And that's where you sit with a couple of nightmares in that space. And uh, of course, uh, poor discipline becomes the, the norm as the ultimate uh, a, a challenge that we are going to have. Now, in the corporate sector, they, they, they make sure that this is part of their uh, embedded embedded governance structure and then of course the the, the documents that we normally rely on uh, the memorandum of incorporation and the king's report they are, we, we normally when we talk about this 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 uh, two documents um they are not the law but you are a bad guy if you don't follow it so that's normally what when we tease each other around it so succession plan for the the board chair in most cases the CEO and other key positions, you know, is, is stipulated within this uh, uh, documentation that we, 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 we are saying. And then within the context of the DOD, this is one of the areas that maybe we must consider learning in that regard. And of course, the succession plan for emergency and over long-term uh, period. In that space, we simply mean if somebody has to resign tomorrow, do we really have uh, an option that uh, we can really, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, get somebody to in that position to make sure that that person is going to be effective in the position. Uh, and then, of course, in a bigger corporate, uh, if you are the CEO, we normally they normally stipulate you are, if you have to resign, this is the time frame. 
that you had to give uh, to the organization. They do that in, in order to make sure that there is a proper handing and taking over from the, 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 the oncoming and the outgoing. Succession plans are reviewed uh, uh, periodically. And, and if, if we don't do that, that's where we often run into a couple of crises as indi indicated earlier on. Of course, when you draft a succession plan, it must stipulate how the successor will be chosen, what kind of knowledge, skills, experience will be required, what training and grooming will be necessary, and how this will be accomplished. Right, in that line, uh, the question is, how are, you, are we going to do it? Um, Leading organizations uh, craft short and long term in, uh, incentives that reward leadership, leaders for creating an environment that develops successes. That will in, include a creative combination of three learning elements. Uh, here, I think you 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 will realize, uh, colleagues, that um, as an academic, I, 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 will, I will come in the area within which I, uh, our expertise rely on. Now, one of the key points is experiential learning, um, giving the successors an opportunity to learn through intended day-to-day -day work ex uh, space experience. Uh, uh, as, as a typical, typical example, example, from time to time, when, when, when I, I travel, I, I make sure that uh, 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 I've got somebody acting on my behalf, and that person has got to see what is the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, work of the team. And then, of course, job exposure uh, established the opportunity to learn from others, both inside and outside the organization in its broader ecosystem across industries and, and functions. In that, what we're trying to, 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 to say within the context of the DOD is mainly when you have uh, short courses uh, being done outside, uh, say, in another military organization, that you set some of these young stars to learn how other uh, uh, military academies are functioning. And then, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the bottom of it is mainly you put the education, though it, uh, I'll, I'll put it the other way around, you put education first as well. Now, developing successors expertise, formal instruction focused on the building, on the building cap capabilities of the member. Uh, it simply meaning in that case that when somebody is important in a position, is that person going to function effectively and knowing what is his or her role in that space? And uh, now from here, uh, uh, Chairperson, I'll, I'll hand over to Dr. Kenny. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Kenny. Uh, thank you very much, committee. Uh, the minister, um, uh, members from uh, the, the service commission. Um, let me thank the opportunity to share some perspectives on this. Um, the, my input um, are limited to uh, some of the things that have already been taken care of by the previous speakers, which is the advantage of coming in as the last speaker. Um, but um, with your indulgence, Chair, uh, let me continue where the um, process ended in terms of the process. Um, uh, you will have noticed that in the presentations, both from the Service Commission and that of, um, of uh, conceptually, the, the, the issue of succession planning, the definition, the understanding kind of um, uh, varies from one environment to another. And also it is defined in different ways. It's quite elastic. So let's accept that. Um, and then as a result, um, these steps are not necessarily prescriptive and uh, they are not all encompassing. It does not follow that you will find them in all the organizations, but um, without these, there will be something wrong with the process of succession planning if these are not considered. Um, starting, for example, with the, the fact that um, uh, all the big bosses of that organization really have to be to participate. They must get involved in the process of succession planning for a simple reason, that um, um, at the end of the day, the, um, it is not about top management only. It has to be about the different levels of the organization, and um, everybody has to buy into it. Secondly, it is very crucial that, um, that there is common understanding of the mandate 
um, of that particular organization and also what uh, capacity is there. It will not be helpful to um, embark on a succession planning process without understanding as to um, what, what kind of skills do you have in your organization. Always a skills audit um, uh, is, a, is a good exercise, is a good step. The next um, part is, Chair, um, it is very important to have a solid performance management system to be in place. If you don't have regular performance appraisals, uh, how do you know who's doing what, where, how capable those people are? You need to have that properly embedded um, um, and then you can see how the, the good guys uh, outshine others. Um, it is also important to understand where is the organization going? Uh, what is the organization likely to look like in future? What kind of mandate or uh, things that it will have to do in future? And uh, therefore you will need to check on whether you have the associated skills for that purpose. So there is the status quo that you will have to be comfortable with but there is also a future view that you need to have. Now, once you have that, you have to develop a development plan, uh, or before that, you have to identify uh, potential staff members for uh, pre-identified positions and um, uh, see where they lack in terms of their skills. If there is a need, you will have to develop them. And obviously, it has been managed as a program in totality, and uh, you evaluate the, the results on an ongoing basis. So that basically um, would entail um, the total menu of things that need to be done or put differently. If you don't do them, your succession planning process will not um, uh, be seen to have been that efficacious. Now, back to the SANDF, um, we thought maybe we need to, to take you back um, in terms of the kind of environment that the SANDF has to um, it does not operate in a vacuum. It operates um, a, as a microscopy of the, of the society. So what happens in society, expectations of society will find their way one way or another into that of the defense force. Now, when we look at, um, as from the period of um, uh, moving into um, a democratic dispensation, what we have done is to parcel the, the, the different periods uh, in, uh, uh, over 10 years. Um, so from 1994 to 2014, to, from 2015 to 2025, and then from 25, 2025 and beyond. We believe that um, the evolution of the succession planning um, uh, challenges um, have to be viewed within the context of these three phases that we have identified. The first one being that of the integration phase, as indicated. Second one being that of the consolidation phase and then the future soldier phase. Um, when um, South Africa um, got into the new democratic order, um, the key priority there was that of integrating the various forces from the different um, armed formations. So in that context, there had to be transitional arrangements in place to put in, um, in place. Um, a lot of legislation was put in place, including white papers and the Defense Review of 1998. But in that context, in that 10 year period, um, there was um, a lot of um, uh, emphasis from the uh, uh, priority perspective of succession planning, emphasis on getting the former non-secretary force members on board. And there was a lot of political considerations and a lot of sens sensitivity. And um, um, so there was a lot of reskilling both um, uh, the, the, the former non-statutory and statutory forces. But the main emphasis was that of, guys, we need to have mutual trust. Let's build mutual trust. Let us be ready to share the same oxygen in the same room uh, without um, getting into each other's throats. So that uh, will be um, uh, the focus of, uh, uh, that, that will have informed uh, succession planning processes 
during um, that period uh, of phase one. In the second period, which we call consolidation phase, it was about saying, all right, guys, we have you now um, uh, working together. You seem to be getting on well with each other. Let's consolidate, let's embed everything in place. We have seen um, some of the challenges in terms of our legislation. In fact, um, a lot of amendments were effected because it was basically a trial and error um, uh, at that point, but um, it was about setting the foundation for the future. How do we see the SNDF um, uh, you know, uh, uh, delivering on the services on its constitutional mandate um, going forward? And that was uh, captured in the defense review amongst others. Um, but at that point, from a succession planning perspective, um, a lot of emphasis was placed on transformation, getting the uh, diversity right, um, you know, getting uh, women on board, um, uh, professionalization or in terms of skills um, uh, development, and also um, the, in terms of operational exposure. So that, that would be uh, what was, um, uh, that is what characterized the consolidation phase. But now <clears throat> um, uh, we believe we are still in that um, uh, environment, but as from 2025, we have to be looking at um, what will the future or the, the soldier of the future look like? Um, what would be the requirements of that time? What are the, um, are we ready? What is the level of readiness um, amongst our um, uh, key role players? So um, uh, informing um, succession planning will be uh, operational experience of um, the relevant players um, and leadership. Uh, it would be very much a performance based, but um, skills and qualification uh, will reign supreme, obviously. It does not mean that those issues are not important now, because as we asked, as we have already said, a lot of professionalization um, uh, had to be had to be uh, done. Um, so, but that will become even more relevant as you move um, into the future, because um, um, if you take the time from 2025 uh, uh, back to 1995, uh, 1994, you will see that. Um, um, uh, by that time, you'll have, um, if any, uh, very few people with um, uh, immediate uh, uh, integration credentials, as it were. But now, what is it that informs um, uh, succession planning within the military, generally speaking? Um, generally speaking, um, as the, the service commissioner, uh, as uh, the presenter has already indicated, age is an issue. Age restriction is an issue because uh, you want people who can still um, uh, chase the enemy, can see the enemy from a distance, uh, help obviously by technology, but uh, you need um, uh, agile soldiers. Now, <clears throat> this is one very contentious area, um, the chair. And I'm saying this with absolute respect, because um, uh, in looking at this, uh, this issue, um, uh, you know, for, for senior members, there is a lot of um, ambiguity, uh, at least from our side, that uh, still needs to be sorted out here. Um, starting with the chief of the South African National Defense Force. Um, the chief of the South African National Defense Force, as you will see shortly, um, is packed at the level of the DG as the head of department and enjoys all the, the, the privileges, benefits that go with uh, being the head of the department together with the Secretary for Defense and so on. So now in terms of the law, you will notice that um, uh, they have a particular dispensation that allows uh, the appointment of the, uh, the, the heads of department to serve a particular term, to serve a particular term, and um, that term will be renewable at the discretion of the executive authority, meaning the minister. So, um, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, section, uh, section 53 or 52 of the Defense Act says 
Um, you will have, um, uh, for regular courses, you need to have people who are no younger than 18, but no older than 65, all right? So um, it means most of the things that we have as it pertains to age restriction is internal um, uh, 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 policies. And um, unfortunately, in terms of the, uh, from uh, our perspective, we could not lay our fingers on that. But age is an issue and is very controversial. Um, so put, put it this way, um, uh, Chair. Uh, in some cases, age uh, as a restriction does not apply. It does not necessarily apply at a particular level, but it is very, um, it is applied, it might be applied inconsistently, which causes a problem. And I'm speaking that, um, I'm saying that under correction. But the other consideration is that of health status. Health status in the sense of, is the person um, um, health was capable of delivering on the mandate? Now, this is equally contentious, Chair. As I said, I say this with absolute respect. Here you would be saying um, a typical soldier should uh, be looking like this, do, be able to do like this at this particular age. Um, if that particular person or that soldier is not capable of doing X, Y, and Z, that soldier will not be um, uh, fit and proper, as it were. So now that becomes also equally contentious. Uh, what kind of health requirements will apply at a particular rank level vis-a-vis -vis, um, at others? But it is a major consideration. The next one um, uh, pertains to operational deployability or fitness. If a soldier cannot deploy, cannot um, um, uh, do operations, uh, is a soldier um, still... Um, should that soldier uh, qualify for uh, identification as a candidate for succession planning or not. The other consideration has to do with the relevant skills and competencies that the soldier would have, uh, apply, uh, would have acquired over a period of time. Um, it, I think uh, this one is well buried down in the sense that uh, they are prescribed courses for each rank group and um, uh, soldiers have to, to go through that. But another aspect, uh, Chair, is that of a promotion cycle for all ranks. That um, you need to have an ongoing promotion um, cycle um, for all ranks so that there is a feeder mechanism to the senior ranks and there's no gap. Um, now, you would have had a presentation from the Chief of Human Resources earlier this year, I think it was in February, where, um, and I think um, the, uh, the previous presenter uh, from the Service Commission has indicated that um, um, at certain rank group levels, you will find that um, a whole bunch of people are, uh, are, are regarded as having stagnated. This is when you look at their level, um, or rank level vis-a-vis uh, -vis their age group. So if you are at this age, or if you are at this rank, at least you should be at this level or other way around. If you are at this age in the military, the expectation is that you, at least you should be operating at this rank level. Okay, now, um, if you look at the, the figures of... Um, that uh, the, uh, the chief uh, provided in uh, February this year to this committee, you will see that uh, for the ranks of um, major general and rear admirals, um, you will have at least 48% um, of them uh, having stagnated. Um, they are already uh, in the rank group uh, 55 to 59, which means um, they are um, about to retire. At the ranks, Brigadier General, or Rear Admiral Junior Grade, you have about 44%. These are big numbers, uh, people who have already stagnated. Now, um, but the key challenge here is that um, uh, you have 
um, um, a lot of majors, kennels, full kennels, um, 30% plus who are also seen as having to stagnate. So at some point, you will have a mass exodus of people leaving um, service and also a gap of um, uh, people that are friends that need to be, uh, to be filled. So that means um, we need to uh, look at that. But I thought, Chair, I should uh, bring this to your attention and the committee that um, um, it looks like the Defense Force has done a good job in terms of um, the diagnostics, in terms of uh, what is the challenge? How do we look like? In other words, it's like doing a body scan uh, to look at um, how one looks, um, you know. So they've done that. From a quantity point of view, they can tell where, uh, you know, per, per rank group, what challenges are they? Uh, where what interventions are required? So that is a quantitative perspective on 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 these. But where the challenge is going to come in is the qualitative side, because there um, you will be looking at issues of um, performance. Is one thing to have uh, uh, you know to have the right age, to have the right uh, what do you call um, rank, but it's another to have uh, the relevant qualities for a particular job. So the qualitative aspect is what is going to be the biggest challenge going forward for the SEDA. Now, what we have done here um, is just to look at uh, these issues, um, taking the, the chiefs of the SEDA since um, 1994, we know that um, uh, what is contentious uh, from the point of view of um, succession planning, one is the number of terms of service. How many save, how many terms did so and so serve? Two, age, as I indicated. At what age did the person exit office? Three, was there um, um, uh, was that age? Uh, limit of 60, uh, which we still, like I indicated, could not uh, lay our fingers on as to the source um, uh, that, uh, of that limit for the heads of department. Was it exceeded? Yes or no? And more importantly, from a succession um, planning perspective, was the immediate appointment of the successor or there was a delay? So. We looked at all the, uh, the generals um, uh, from 1994 up to the current one, um, where we discovered that uh, uh, only uh, one general, uh, when he left the office, was, uh, I mean, he had already served two terms and was at the age of 65. Okay. Now, uh, Obviously, now I've already indicated uh, the issue of age with respect to the heads of department, where the chief of the SNDF is paired that. Um, so whether you will say uh, there was, uh, okay, let me put it this way. One, the, the head of department or the chief of the SNDF can be appointed uh, for more than one term but cannot be appointed, cannot serve a second term of more than five years. So yeah, put differently, after having completed the first term, the minister could have given him one year, two years, three, two years, three years, but it will not exceed five years, okay? So in other words, a, a, if the, if the general left at 65, which means it is still within that term uh, period. Um, the next one, we went to look at um, a sample of chiefs of services uh, in South Africa. As to, from their point of view, um, uh, how have they had successors appointed on time uh, or not? There was, um, uh, an, uh, how can I put it, 
an aberration in the case of um, um, General Mokosi, uh, because uh, Major General Dikude, uh, Dikude had to act. Similarly, with the Chief of Air Force, um, uh, after General Msimang, um, there was somebody who had to act there for a while. But other than that, um, other than that, all of them were appointed on time. Now, in the case of the SGs, the, of the Session Generals, um, uh, two of them uh, exceeded six, uh, 60 years. But now, if you look at this, if you look at the previous slide on the chiefs of the SNDF and um, uh, the chiefs of services, would you say that uh, uh, there was um, uh, a norm of exceeding and uh, was there an any aberration here? Our argument is that there is no, uh, there is no aberration. Um, it just so happened that one person uh, out of the five had served two. Um, so an exception does not uh, uh, prove um, the rule, as you all know. In the case of the Lieutenant Generals, who are not heads of department, that is where uh, there was uh, uh, an aberration. Because in their case, um, the uh, they rules of the head of department would not apply, um, as would have been the case with the Chief of the ACNDF. Now, there are factors that um, will warrant consideration by the, AC, by the ACNDF from a succession point of view. Um, as it relates to the Chief of the ACNDF, um, should it always be the army person? Or should, should there be some kind of a rotation? Now, uh, we know that um, these people do not appoint themselves. The commander in chief does so on the advice of the minister. But it's something that needs to be considered. Um, Ami, as the, uh, the senior of all these other services, will always get their preference. Um, but um, uh, for how long can it, uh, can it be the army um, in general? So at some point, questions might be asked there. Secondly, in terms of the skills and competency, we spoke about the future soldier um, uh, phase, the kind of combination uh, of skills and competencies that are required um, for the future general will require that uh, um, a certain minimum level of education must be um, enforced. Gone should be the days where, uh, 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 you know, general will say or admiral will say, no, this is, uh, you know, uh, computers are for the youngsters, it's not for us. You know, they, that, uh, there are certain things that uh, they don't uh, need to bother about. The assumption is that at a certain level, a uh, major, major, um, Lieutenant Colonel and, and upward, they would have been exposed to computer related analysis and um, understanding of how technology works, such that by the time they become generals, they are comfortable with matters of um, online stuff, um, uh, IT based stuff. The third consideration, Chair, is that uh, the Defense Force is a microcosm of the society and to continue to be looking at diversity at all levels, in all formation, in all arms of service and divisions. This can never be, um, there can never be a compromise on this matter because uh, the uh, Defense Force is um, a very uh, sensitive environment. They, are, uh, they always try to be um, disciplined, but my view in my interaction with the uh, leadership of the Defense Force, is that, um, you know, when you look at what is happening in Africa and many other countries, coups are not necessarily um, conducted by the generals themselves. The main architects of coups are, uh, are colonels and lower, and then influence the big guns to see that. But why is it that they, these things happen? It's because of inherent um, uh, kind of challenges that are not tackled head on 
and diversity is one of those. So uh, South Africa has got a very um, structured way of um, dealing with matters of transformation and diversity as I've already indicated. These must just be um, implemented and also considered during succession planning processes. Obviously, baseline training is crucial as I've already indicated, but the last point, Chair, uh, on this matter, the concept of cradle to grave approach should be considered. I know that it is a sensitive matter, but um, at age 60, uh, soldiers are still very young and um, they can still do a lot of things. They can still contribute a lot to society. Therefore, um, in the post-service environment, what are we saying these generals uh, should do? Uh, not all of them can become a military ombuds. Um, we are not so fortunate as we'd have in other countries where the defense force will be running companies, big companies, running hotels, transport, uh, uh, energy, and all of those things. Ordinarily, you would have these um, generals being seconded to or forming part of the defense industry after service. So they continue to contribute to society and national security. But in South Africa, once the person has retired, he or she is on her own or he on his own. So we need to look at this aspect and see what can be done uh, beyond uh, uh, retirement. As we conclude, Chair, we believe that um, um, the SNDF of 2022 uh, 20, uh, um, uh, is fast evolving beyond the imperatives of integration and um, implementation and positioning itself for the future soldier. We have seen that um, uh, in terms of the transfer of leadership, it has always been smooth uh, with minor exceptions, exceptions here and there. Exceptions being in the area of delays for appointing the next one, um, not necessarily in terms of being disruptive. So that is uh, the area of concern. As I've already indicated, career planning, we will need to look at what happens um, uh, after service. Talent management is important as uh, we have um, our MSDS, uh, we have our uh, training processes that are structured for each rank group. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we're not too sure if uh, uh, we have sufficient feed assistance. If you look at the MSDS, my understanding is that this is being done every second year um, instead of every year. Now that might be, uh, that might cause a lot of problems um, down the line because uh, you want, um, it might have been introduced for a particular purpose, but um, um, it is important that you have a constant feeder system on an annual basis so that you don't have a gap somewhere down the line because this will definitely catch up with us. Um, the performance, manage, performance management system has to be very credible. It must be seen to be fair, to be fair and free of corruption. Um, the soldiers that are disgruntled because they have been promoted, uh, they've done all the courses but now, now are not being promoted. Um, at lower levels, those would be much, would be plausible. But at senior levels, the, the pyramid gets narrower and narrower. So those will not be possible, but you need to have a, a proper performance management system such that when you have to do your succession planning, you are not wondering as to um, whether I have sufficient material to work with. Lastly, we need to improve on the accountability of leadership at all levels, at all levels because succession planning should not be the exclusive um, uh, uh, province of top management only. It has to happen at all levels so that they can see that there is upward mobility, people get motivated and, and, and our leadership uh, does and conducts this process in an accountable fashion. Uh, there are uh, actions, there are process um, are all beyond reproach. So we have to inculcate that at the lower level so that by the time people become big people, 
you're not introducing a new concept of accountability. When you say you should have done X, Y, and Z, and they say Y. Um, Chair, that will conclude um, our input, uh, uh, Professor Tsesha and myself on the matter. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Tsetla, as well as uh, Dr. Kanyide for your um, an in depth uh, presentation uh, tonight. And uh, I think the two presentations, um, the DF, uh, SC, and, and your presentation, um, they complement uh, each other. Um, there are no contradictions, nothing, nothing at all. Uh, it's clear that the presentation uh, tonight is uh, evidence-based. Uh, and uh, you also emphasize the point of uh, orderly uh, transi uh, transition and that uh, we must avoid the leadership vacuum. Uh, critically, there must be a continuity. Uh, you also identify and uh, also you also identify a risk. Um, the risk you have identified add to the, the, the list of risk that uh, the defense force um, uh, identified uh, in, in, in the in their, uh, uh, presentation. Uh, but both presentations uh, emphasize on the extended uh, period of, um, um, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> acting uh, capacity as a result of uh, 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 vacancies uh, being held uh, or left open for a very long uh, time and the impact that that has on uh, decision uh, making. Uh, you have touched on the different uh, perspectives, um, historical perspective, uh, essentially highlighting uh, the phases that uh, the, as the new defense force had to go through um, integration phase and the, the things that they have to grapple with uh, during that phase, and the second phase, consultation phase. And uh, that is when, um, you know, where the SNTF was assured of stability and really ready to take off. And uh, that is between 2015 and uh, 2025. Um, the defense review, is anchored on this uh, particular uh, phase, but the problem is the non-implementation of that uh, uh, defense review because it was looking at uh, what the SNDF was able to achieve uh, between 1994 and 2014 and what it's set to do uh, into the future. Um, so, and uh, what type of personnel uh, it will need and what type of uh, equipment that uh, would be required uh, by, the, by the personnel. And then you also touch on the 2025 and, and beyond. Now looking at what type of uh, a soldier uh, are we, are we uh, looking at? Uh, it will be a different uh, soldier indeed because of uh, uh, technology maybe would not need so many people on the ground and uh, you, you, you know and two uh, the change in the way um, you know uh, wars uh, are fought um, see may, maybe they will be dominating the skies than being uh, ground uh, all the time I, I don't know uh, so, so I'm I'm happy you have touched on all these issues, and um, and you have also touched on the rotational um, the SNDF, the appointment of uh, an SNDF, and you say it's not rotational. I assume you want to suggest that uh, the chiefs are always drawn from 
uh, the ranks of uh, chief uh, chiefs of the army, uh, as opposed to from the other uh, arms of service. I don't know. Um, you, 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 you weren't that uh, clear on that one, but I took that as what you are trying to say. Colleagues, um, this now opens up uh, the platform uh, for uh, the discussion. And uh, let me just check if the, uh, the commissioners, uh, they have anything to, to say uh, before I open it up uh, 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 for discussion. Commissioners, are there anything that you want to add one or two? Not, not from my side, Chair. I think I'll participate in the discussion. In the discussion, okay. Already I see a long list of hands. Um, I was asking this question to buy time. Mm -hmm. uh, the colleagues are already to engage. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, okay, I'm going to list the, the, the people as I see the hands. Um, Mr. Mare is number one. Uh, followed by Mr. Mutle, Mutle, uh, followed by uh, Raider. Uh, then I see Shelembe. Uh, uh, I see uh, Robinson. Uh, colleagues, uh, Robinson is proving the point that is the discussion for all of us. Yeah, because I'm sure he's itching to comment on the presentation of the of the other colleagues, and there's also a a, a Mozomai, Mozomai. All right, all right. So this is the 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 the, the, the I'm going to follow this. Chair, my hands is uh, it's invisible. Yes, no, I've noted you. I said Chair, uh, Mare. My hand is up as well. Yes, no, no, I've noted you, Mr. Motley. Now you have me. not noted me, Chair. You've forgotten me. <laughs> I heard, okay. I, I okay. Heard yes, you are, you, you are number two. Yeah, number two. Um, I'm going to, I was going to repeat uh, the hands. Uh, is Mr. Mare, Mr. Motley, Mr. Reda, Mr. Shelembe, Mr. Robinson, Mr. Matsumai. Um, so those are the hands I've seen. So I was in that order, please, I invite you, Mr. Mare. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for the two presentations. Um, a really valuable in information, so it's much appreciated. My first and my question to a certain extent is to both, um, especially around the one force design principle. We sit with regular force, and then we sit with a reserve force. My, my perception is that both have concentrated on regular force, which obviously, you know, brings us into, uh, you know, the, 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 the consideration of what happens in the reserve force, because we know that there's no single operation, whether it's domestically or abroad on, on the borders, where it is only regular force that is that is deployed. It's the regular force and reserve force. So where do we sit with reserve force members? Um, and do we say that 60 is now the, 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 the ultimate age for anyone to belong to the reserve force as well? Because if we say no, then do we say that it is only regular force members up to the age of 60 who can take control or charge of an operation, what happens in those cases if you've got great people, but in terms of age, you know, they, they are now restricted. Also on age, um, I have always believed if you are good enough for a job, you are either old enough or you are young enough. You get people that is on 55, so old they can do nothing, but then you get people on 65, who's still energetic, who's still fit, and, and who can do an absolute great job, and maybe he or she seems to is also a very good leader. So who decided on this limitation of age? Because that seems to be, you know, the, 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 the cut off and the, the decisive thing. 
But I just wanted to get behind that and uh, whether the consideration, especially by the by the Defence Force Service Commission has, has been given to, to kind of challenge or do research and kind of challenge why the, 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 the restriction in terms of age. Um, it'll be very important to also get their feedback around, you know, how do we incorporate all of what they've said with the Reserve Force? Whether there was some um, interaction with the Reserve Force Council, because on that side, we also know that we, we, we need, for instance, a, a chief of the SA Reserve Force, which we do not have. The Reserve Force, can that be full-time employees of the Reserve Force while they are retired from the uh, regular force? In other words, some people might say it's double dipping because they've retired from the, the regular force, but they are appointed as full-time employees or in some positions in the Reserve Force, which some might say is a double dipping. Other might say, no, it's just a, a next career going on. So, so how do we deal with that? When it comes to succession planning, sometimes, sometimes there are people who decide on certain people to go on certain courses, and this should be your career planning and your career future. In other cases, you might have individuals who said, I'm doing my own career planning. In five years' time, I won't be there. On 10 years' time, I want to be on that level. Um, in some cases, some other people might then prevent that person from following that career, or in some cases, that person might just be not good enough, but not knowing it him or herself, or admitting to him or herself. How do we deal with that specific challenges? Um, and then also, um, when we look at the at the challenges of the past versus the future. We sit with cost of employees, which we know are too high. Um, the minister has also referred to that we need, that we have a bloated, her words was bloated uh, top structure. To what extent was, was that considered and whether, you know, we are actually bloated or not? Sometimes people say that we are like a mushroom, uh, too top heavy, um, and not and not enough people, you know, below them, or that we are too top heavy. If we go into the future, and we must have a a different structure, to what has that been considered um, and incorporated into these two um, challenges? We also have got a situation where we come from uh, a structure of that deals with conventional threats and conventional warfare versus unconventional, or, and I think the chair referred to that, into the future might be a total different threat. It might be high technology, it might be uh, uh, air, it might be a different uh, type of threat and, and uh, requirements that we might have, especially for leaders in, in the Defence Force. To what extent has that been, has that been considered? This is from the, from the um, uh, Defence Force Service Commission. Um, have, they, have they consulted or discussed some of these um, uh, points with the Reserve Force Council? Um, and have they made certain recommendations in that regard? Um, the last thing that I just wanted to ask um, uh, um, Dr. Kanyele, and, and, and it's just, you know, it just came up. You are saying that General Mpanya, um, his age when leaving is, is incumbent and his age exceeded 60 is not applicable. What, what does he mean by not applicable? Because if you are over 60, you are over 60. And we all know that he is over 60, which in, in itself is not a problem. But I just want to know why, why that has been indicated like that. And my view is it doesn't matter from which arms of service. The, the, uh, the chief must come, it must be someone that is good enough, it must be somebody that must have the capabilities to lead the, the whole defence force as a one force, and that's either, you know, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Surgeon General, but most certainly incorporated in all of that are elements of the Reserve Force. So, to you know, have they look at that and if they can just respond to a few of those. Thank you, Chair.
Thank you, Mr. Mare. Uh, quite a mouthful. Uh, Honorable Mutle. Thank you, Chair. Am I audible? The system yes, yes. is kicking me in and out. I'm not sure what's going on. Yes, you are audible, sir. Which means you will not set your video on. Am I audible, Chair? Yeah, yes, you are. Oh, no, thank, thank, thank you. So your, your, system, your system will not enable you to set your video on. I'm asking a question. Oh, we've lost him. Uh, I, I, I get the impression that we've got a, that he's got a very bad connection or signal. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, yes, maybe it will not uh, setting the video on might uh, cause more uh, instability uh, on the his network. All right. It looks as though we have lost Tabo. Uh, let me just check him again uh, if he's still on the platform. And now it's disappeared. All right, let me skip him for now. Uh, Mr. Reda, you are next. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you for the presentations. Good evening, everybody. Uh, well covered uh, by Mr. Murray in many aspects. A uh, couple of questions that I, that I just wanted to pick up on. And the first one is that, you know, with 107 general senior officers retiring <clears throat> in the next five years, uh, one would have thought that there was no shortage um, of, uh, of applicants or, or suitable applicants um, to ensure that positions filled quite promptly and quite quickly. And I'm wondering why uh, it is that there's, there's not an ability to fill, fill positions quickly. Um, you know, I understand that's part of the reason that we're here. But surely we trust our people. If we don't trust our people, they shouldn't be there and we should find ways of getting rid of them. That's question one. Question two would have been to the minister. Unfortunately, I see she has left already. But yeah, really, really just a case of, you know, if there are 107 senior members that are about to, to retire, um, is that a good time to start reconsidering uh, the structure, considering that, uh, that it has been indicated that our our uh, structure is currently top heavy, um, and perhaps uh, based on our mandate, uh, certainly this uh, this committee uh, should be taken into, into confidence in terms of, of the plans in terms of that going forward. Um, and then to perhaps emphasize or, 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 or ask a slightly different question, you know, is, is, is the fluidity between the reserve force um, and the regular force in terms of, of promotional prospects and so on, and not only for the, the top top of the job, um, but for for all, of, all all senior positions, you know, to what degree is there fluid fluidity, um, where if there is a qualifying capable uh, person in the reserve force, um, you know, do, do is is there a mechanism to ensure that they uh, are put it forward for consideration? And certainly, you know, are they invited to do so? You know, how much career planning goes in? Um, uh, because it really is important, I believe, for many members of the reserve force to have that career planning. Because you know, really, this the issue of being called up from time to time, uh, and at the top of the hat, you 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 give up everything else, in your life to go and 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 do your country's bidding. Uh, it, 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 it's it's a highly honourable. Uh, undertaking, but certainly we need to ensure that uh, there is some career planning that goes in, in in conjunction with that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Reiter. Uh, Bob Shelembe. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Um, Chairperson, because of the, the, the network was bad, you know, one was like, you know, losing the network uh, coming again. I don't know what's happening today, tonight. Um, the, 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 question, the other question, I think now, the one that I was going to concentrate, you know, I mean, uh, um, Mr. Marie, you know, has touched on it, but Chairperson, um, mine was like um, having, I mean, uh, seen 
or getting the reports from the department, I mean, that um, it was like there were a shortage of funds, I mean, uh, to ensure a, a proper, I mean, training or, I mean, um, time being, make, make, being made available to, 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 to train or to capacitate um, the reserve force. Now, my question is, with the challenge of having uh, the short shortage of funds uh, to upgrade, I mean, uh, members of uh, the reserve force, what impact does it have when it comes to the succession uh, planning? Uh, if there is, um, I'll appreciate maybe to know because we cannot, I mean, uh, just carry on um, not uh, using what we have to upgrade so that we are able to, to, to achieve a better succession uh, planning. Uh, the other one, uh, Chairperson, uh, you know, that issue of, I mean, uh, the vacancies that are taking long uh, to be filled isn't, uh, is also uh, causing a challenge when it comes to the issue of a succession plan because, I mean, uh, if those uh, vacancies say maybe there are people, I mean, who are second in charge, and you find maybe their positions are not a main field. I just want to know what plan do they have now to ensure that, I mean, that issue of taking long to fill uh, the vacancies uh, do they have uh, to avoid, I mean, uh, that uh, vacuum when it comes to uh, the top, I mean, uh, of filling of position. Uh, the other one, Chairperson, uh, when it comes to the issue of um, like that, uh, they mentioned sort of like in bigger um, companies, memorandum of uh, incorporation, um, that they normally organize sort of, I mean, a short and long-term uh, incentives. Uh, maybe if they can put a picture uh, to, to, to us that um, what type, I mean, uh, of, uh, short and long-term incentives so that one can think whether those uh, incentives are achievable or not. Uh, another thing, uh, Chairperson, when it comes to this uh, succession planning, I know that uh, it's something that doesn't augur well uh, to other members when uh, it takes place because it becomes like a uh, those in charge are selective, you know, they have got that power. Now, is there any sort of a, a criteria or, I mean, a, a, the, 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 the section or management that is responsible to see to it that uh, those people um, who may be uh, taken to be qualifying uh, as uh, top performers and be ready uh, for succession plan without, I mean, uh, any favor, because that's what, I mean, uh, normally uh, you'll find people leaving, I mean, uh, the industry or the department because they feel the criteria that is used, I mean, to see or to select the best performers uh, to be used when it comes to the succession plan. I'm just maybe if they can uh, maybe uh, give me the government that whether there is, I mean, a clear criteria that will be used by the department to ensure that there's no favoritism when it comes to that uh, promotion. The last one, Chairperson, uh, I don't know whether this one applies when you speak of, I mean, uh, the leadership uh, and also the intents uh, in the Defense Force uh, in uh, the Commission, I mean, uh, in, in the defense, I mean, itself. Um, normally, you'll find that uh, people, I mean, are trained within and um, maybe taken for some sort of uh, causes. For instance, maybe uh, when it comes to other position in the department, some may need, I mean, a, a, a better understanding of uh, the management. Whether, I mean, the department is got sort, sort of, I mean, within, or they can, I mean, uh, some of the of, of, of members of the force can be taken and trained and sign the contract. So when they, got the, they get the job, they will not, I mean, leave the defense until a certain, I mean, a period. So now I'm not sure whether I mean uh, in uh, they do deal with the sort of I mean uh, 
the leadership and interns within uh, the, the department. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Robinson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank, thanks uh, uh, very much. Um, I want to really compliment um, the, uh, the prof and the doc from University of Stellenbosch. I think uh, that presentation in particular is very thought provoking um, and it will just go into the melting pot of ideas. I think it's really important. There's a couple of comments I want to make rather than direct questions. And I'm sure that as the debate opens up, some of these issues will be answered. One of the first few slides was for me very telling. It puts the issue of succession planning in, in, in context. And I, I quote, it says, succession, succession planning is essentially a process of getting the right people onto the bus, taking the wrong people off the bus and positioning the right people in the right seats. For me, it couldn't be, and it's an academic who uh, quoted from a book. For me, I think that is absolutely telling um, because my experience in the par in, in, in dealing with military and the public service in general, sometimes we've got the wrong people. Um, so this quote is, is very important. That's the one comment. The second comment is around the performance management system. The way the performance management system is structured at the moment, I know certainly within the uh, civilian component, the people who work in Department of Defense but are uh, appointed under the Public Service Act. Uh, I don't know whether their performance contracts is similar to the uh, people in uniform. But for me, we need to begin to engage with the Department of Public Service and Administration, with uh, the um, uh, there's another uh, the, the, the commission um, public service commission to make it appropriate for defense force personnel people in uniform because if you look at the performance management over many years it's basically a tick box and for me it doesn't really incentivize so that the uh, members to do, to go the extra mile. Maybe uh, uh, members in uniform, uh, slightly different. Uh, the third comment is around <clears throat> the, 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 the feeder system. Uh, Doc Kanyele mentioned about the MSDS. For, for me, one of the difficulties we face in going forward is given the high level of unemployment in the country, when people apply to uh, do the MSDS for two years, essentially they want a job. I don't get a sense that they committed to being a soldier for the next 40, 40 years, 50 years. So it becomes a job for them. Uh, and I'm sure if you look at the the applications for the MSDS, there's thousands and you take in only a few hundred. So those for me are some of the key issues that we need to, um, uh, to begin to look at and unpack and draw down a bit more. Um, a couple of comments around the uh, questions from, from, from uh, I think Mr. Murray, Honorable Murray and uh, Honorable Ryder. Maybe uh, uh, Tabo, Tabo Magabani, who's more acquainted with the issue of reserves, maybe he wants to comment on that, but certainly I'm, I'm not in a position to go into the detail of some of those issues. Um, but uh, I'm, I, I think that's enough for, for now, Chair. Uh, those three issues for me are, are absolutely critical. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I see that Tabo Mutle is back. Uh, Mr. Mutle? Good 
No, th thank you, Chair. I'll try to be quick before I get uh, cut off. Uh, maybe let me start by uh, first uh, appreciating uh, the presentations that were made uh, to the committee today. Uh, one clarity question, actually, is just to solicit a view from uh, uh, Prof and, uh, and the doc there. Uh, uh, in in relation to uh, uh, their presentation and what I have always uh, been advocating for and impressing on uh, uh, Admiral Google to, to, look, to look on uh, around the issue of uh, rejuvenation uh, in a sense that uh, uh, we must see a a general, probably a three-star general at the age of uh, around 40 and 45. Because for me, an ideal situation is to have a four-star general who's in the 50s, uh, who will be able to serve uh, two term without uh, and retire around 60 and 60 something, not exactly at 65. That will be an ideal situation. But one of the... Uh, issues that uh, they always uh, bring forth is that uh, for you to reach at, uh, that particular level at that age, uh, the courses that are offered does not permit that. So what is it that can be done to ensure that uh, uh, the courses that uh, uh, soldiers must do to reach uh, that particular level at, at, three-star general to a four-star general at an appropriate and an acceptable age, as opposed to what we are experiencing right now, where the chiefs, even the chiefs of uh, arms of uh, services might serve one term because of uh, the issue of age. And that for me, I find it very problematic. Uh, if I can get a view from from academia, what is it that can be done to transform that particular situation so that uh, uh, rejuvenation becomes effective, even at that level? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Motsumai, thank you very much, Tabo. Uh, chairperson. Chairperson. Nagina Lubutata books at the Gumper Saint Arona and Amabalula Kulesef by NSF National Statistics Forces by Longor Bunti Babone, Jolly Havasibit. So Nagabato Zabar criteria A CDP Swangia who select Marisevist. Key thing. Kobano Hoko Panalo Nemar is a Vistian. Kabana Yone, a bio mod data mod data PC. Kabako no la Habaka Limal, Bagaya go one mil or Baya go twenty one battalion. You are a cardinal never to be long or batim Batavanella Hulesaho Bamalova. Kobanan ma reservist. Kifirite chepese. Thank you very much. Um, I would love the, the, the colleague um, who was able to get uh, the, the this input um, who understand the language to respond when he does, he or she does, must ask him to do it in English so that as he responds, we get the benefit of what the, of, of the question as well. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I've covered all the hands. Um, let me say uh, say. Uh, let me add that um, I'm excited uh, about these two uh, presentation uh, tonight. Um, you see, uh, you know, a training. It's. Um, both formal and informal. 
formal training you receive from you know uh, accredited uh, institutions um, you either go there uh, do it physically or it becomes a distance um, uh, tuition or learning um, and there's also the, uh, an informal uh, training uh, that is when for instance um, you get a, a training in an informal way like we are doing uh, tonight uh, this is i con we consider this as uh, part of a, a training uh, uh, members of, of parliament um, <clears throat> the minister when both of us were uh, uh, together here in the, in, in, KZN, in the provincial legislature. Uh, after listening to the, the presentations, um, budget policy uh, uh, speeches by the different uh, MECs and uh, the debates that um, you know, uh, followed the, the presentation uh, of these uh, 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 policies, budget policy speeches. He said, you, you, this is a training in action. Um, training in action because you get information that uh, in one day or two days or in a week that um, <clears throat> uh, you know, is packaged for in some cases for a year in, in some uh, institutions. And um, so that's the, the, the type of uh, training uh, we receive informally, but it goes right to, 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 to the core. Uh, it it, it uh, uh, provides uh, capacitation for, for members. I really should thank you um for for your presentation uh, uh, tonight and uh, <clears throat> there was um you know both presentations um did not touch on this controversial uh, issue <laughs> um, in the past we had conscription and um in the symposium uh, we, we held, uh, Dr. Kanyele was there. Uh, it, it was mentioned that um, uh, the, the conscription uh, brought with it uh, skills, you know, experience, and uh, that um, the, SN, the, the defense force at the time uh, did not have to um, build. It came, uh, it was a ready-made uh, skill uh, and experience uh, because as people were conscripted, uh, they joined the defense force and um, contributed in the areas that they were, um, uh, you know, uh, familiar with, uh, you know, contributing at their craft. Now, when this was abandoned, um, was uh, abolished, it left the Defense Force uh, uh, scarce on skills and, and experience that each time whenever it wanted a particular skill, it must go out and source from outside at a cost, you know, a market-related cost. And yet during the construction, it was coming uh, free, basically free of charge, you know, at, at, at a considerably less uh, cost at, at the time. Now, so, the abolish the the, the 
when, when, the, when this was abolished, it then robbed the SNDF um, of uh, what in the past used to, to get. And this was not replaced. Um, there was no replacement. And, um, uh, but if you look uh, on the ground, uh, there is a feeling generally that uh, people, young people want to join the military. This time voluntarily, not as uh, conscripts. You open it up, they will swell in their numbers. Uh, I'm not too sure if the country has looked at it in terms of uh, what, um, it, in terms of discipline, in terms of um, uh, benefits that uh, the country would uh, derive from, from that exercise. So, oh, and, and also that some may even say, look, I choose the Defense Force as my carrier of choice, as opposed to what um, a, a country member who said that the MSDS sometimes is still, some people look at it as one way of addressing, um, you know, the, you know uh, the issue of unemployment. Look, I've been looking for a job. I don't find it. Let me go and spend a year or two in, in the military. So, so I think that that was the issue. And uh, lastly, for me, uh, we discuss the issue of um, you know SNDF uh, having people at an advanced age and who would live at almost the same time. And uh, the example of 177 generals who would be gone by 2027. 20, uh, what uh, scares me is, is, is that as that happens, the, we are not feeding uh, from the bottom. Uh, the feeder system is, is, very, is very weak. Even the MSDS, uh, the way people are recruited and um, I don't think it's done with an aim of addressing, uh, making it a, an effective uh, feeder system. I'm raising this point, uh, uh, judging by the number of people who at the end of two years have had to leave uh, the SNTF because uh, uh, the SNTF cannot absorb them. They've received this training in the end, SNDF says, well, look, yes, uh, we can't uh, take you. Uh, and then they are left uh, to the streets. And uh, you leave, you, these people are, are let out to the streets with military uh, skill. Um, and, and that's it's certainly not uh, uh, helpful. It raises its own uh, threat uh, to society. And um, thank you very much for, for, for the presentation. And uh, let me now allow you colleagues uh, to comment and uh, in enriching uh, the discussion. Uh, Peter, um, you are on the platform. I know that Velem has apologized as uh, Velem, Dr. Janse van Resbach. Do you want to say anything uh, by way of comment before I let the colleagues uh, to just um, respond to the comments? Peter Daniels. Uh, thank you, evening chair members and invited guests. Chair, I know at this stage, um, most of the issues that we even have in the background um, has been covered, but uh, I, I, I think maybe we should just ask the Defense Force Service Commission, as we've done while we were on oversight visits, you know, uh, what were some of the issues that the troops raised directly with them um, when they went on their visits to the units, chair? Thank you. Okay. No, thank you very much. Okay, colleagues, I now hand over to uh, you. Anyone who wish, wishes to uh, comment on, on all the questions and comments that uh, members raised? Um, I don't know, where, there's no particular order. Um, I will take a hand as I see it. Uh, Professor Tetla. Uh, Yes. Good, good, good evening. This is how I look in case you, you forgot how I look. 
Um, yeah, there is a lot of uh, things that have been raised, and some of which I think will uh, demand the discussion with the top echelon as well of the Defence Force, uh, I must say. Now, the Honourable Mare, you, you raise a lot of things there in terms of the reserve forces and so on. Um, I think maybe the Defence Force Service Commission, to a great extent, they might con uh, contribute uh, uh, big enough on that line. Uh, I think I just want to put one line that uh, if one look at the Defence uh, 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 Review document, it, it clearly on Chapter 11 spells out what, what what is the process that can be followed. And I think if we can follow that uh, as a lead, to, as a starting point to make sure that we solve some of the challenges that are experienced within the reserve force environment. And I think that can be one of the, the big issues, which of course, uh, 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 jump down to what the Honorable uh, uh, Mr. Traber indicated in terms of conscription of the past and so on. There, with regards to the uh, self force training on chapter 11 it also spells out that you might also uh, get these guys to qualify to be educated so that if ever they leave they leave with something behind their back and i think down the line on the national government they came with the national youth uh, development skill and that uh, somehow died out i would sus suspect it was because of the budget issues. I've seen some of those youngsters, they were training here in Saldana Bay at the, 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 the military base. And then once they graduate, you see a different person altogether. And I think that is an opportunity also to rejuvenate our defense force as well. Um, I'm saying that against the background that uh, even this uh, military skills development program that is run by the Department of Defense, like you rightfully uh, pointed out, the, some of the, the members are absorbed within the Department of Defense and some after two years they leave. And the fundamental question is what is the skill that we imparted on the, the members? Oftentimes, um, it's mainly the skills of using weapons as well. And that might create other challenges if that person is found destitute on the street. Then then it, it can be a bit a bit of a challenge. Now, again, I think some of the things that uh, I've seen um, with regards to how other countries are solving issues of stagnation within ranks. Um, the, the, the many countries, I think the Germans, they use the, the same system. They give the people almost 25 year career. And I think we exit that by far to a great extent. 25 year, year career in the sense that if you don't reach a, a, a rank of a lieutenant colonel within the next 25 years or a full colonel, then you are out of the system. And then I think it speaks to what uh, Dr. Kanile uh, indicated earlier on. Uh, if in the next 25 years, that person will be 30, 35 to 40, uh, uh, if by the time he joined the defense force or she joined the defense force, 45, you are told you don't have a job. What else are you going to do? And that's where we don't really, as a county, we don't have a synergy as to how are we going to leverage that expertise that the members uh, live in the defense force with. And uh, largely in many counties, they join the broader, either the defense sector or they, pro they join the, 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 the security cluster as a whole. And those are some of the things that we must think about as, as we go forward. One of the other things we can, can also consider is the when we do the planning session i think that uh, uh, will need the attention of uh, all of us to a great extent um, uh, let me speak from the university perspective uh, we, we are now working on a document called strategy 2040 that's the projection of the, the university where it's going in the next uh, number of years with that said now we look as to what is the future student that we are going to get and then what kind of a future lecturer we need. We need to look as to what is the future uh, a soldier that we need and what kind of wars that are going to be fought in the future. And then you pl plan from 40 years and then you come back and you cascade down. And that's also a touch base with what uh, Mr. Mutle indicated earlier on to say, how are we going to fast track these guys to make sure that by the time we need the technocrat to look in the, in the sky with all technologies, uh, 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 these guys are, are well educated to a great extent. Now, one of the challenge we have, um, the, the, the militaries in, in, in most kind of countries is a pyramid where 
is bloated on the ground and then of course on the top it becomes a little bit smaller as, as it goes up it's the same with us the challenge we have is this thing that i indicated earlier on uh, we normally have a long-term career in the defense force which actually impact of, on the number of posts we are currently having and that also impact on the lower uh, rank to go up now in terms of career management uh, the, 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 there are areas within uh, the, in which the defense was doing well uh, uh, if, if somebody is a second lieutenant they know how many courses they must do to become a full lieutenant they know how many courses they must do to become captains. They know how many courses they must do to become measures. And, and, and the list goes on. Once they reach a full kennel, lieutenant kennel level, that's where we sit with the challenge because the number of posts going up, they are, they, are, they are quite very small. That's where many other countries, they say, if you can reach this level of a full kennel, then, then you, you must exit the system. And I, I'm not suggesting that that would be the best fit for us, but it's one of the options that we can, we can look at. Um, the issue of uh, performance management system, um, I think Dr. Canilo will touch on some of these things. However, what, what, what I need to, to, to say there, for you to do it correctly, is you must be in a position to quantify uh, what you're doing. Now, my key performance area is, is one of them is, you know, we must produce uh, research as a faculty. Then when I go to discuss with my boss in the form of director as to uh, what did I, how did I perform? He wants the number associated to the, 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 uh, the number of research that the faculty has produced under my leadership. Then you can quantify that. And once it's not quantifiable, it becomes a little bit fluid. And then like uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Robertson indicated earlier on, it becomes a tick box to a great extent if, if you don't quantify what you are trying to do. Now, the other challenge is that issue of, uh, I think Mr. Robertson touched on, on it. You often get the guys that are looking for a job and then you, you take them into the system and you realize these are not committed guys. Um, what other countries um, uh, uh, do, they make sure that these guys, when they come into the system, they first educate them and train them at the same time. Within a period of time, they profile these guys to see this one is a soldier, this one is not. And when that person leaves, that person leaves with some form of uh, education plus some form of training. And that that person is useful, to, is, I mean, it's useful to the society at large. But uh, at the moment, uh, I think that's where we are grappling as to how are we going to get that fit as a country to a great extent. Um, the other issue is the issue of uh, the veterans of the past. Uh, I happen to have understood the, uh, our brother there in relation to the veterans and what are the benefits. And I think that that line, I think, should be discussed briefly with the military veterans uh, structure within the Department of Defense. I think once that can be discussed within that space, and I, I know for, for sure that there are some sort of benefits that these members uh, can have. Uh, but then now the challenge becomes if they want to be employed, then there's something else that must be discussed, discussed within the defense HQ. Um, I will come back at a later stage if I think of any other stuff that I can I can touch on. Uh, and then I think uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Dr. Kanyele or our colleague within the Defense Force Service Commission. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Doc? Um, thanks a lot, uh, Chair. Um, uh, it's... These questions are so tricky, Chair. We need your protection because uh, we're just uh, teachers. We're just teachers here at school. Uh, and, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, only the DOD can uh, answer some of them. So we need your protection. I now, um, starting with uh, uh, Mr. Honorable Mare's um, um, uh, questions, um, on the one force design principle, I think um, it is important to understand what that entails. What that entails basically is that um, um, the South African National Defense Force comprises those, point, those uh, uh, components. There is a full-time component. There is a 
the reserve component. Um, now, for operations, for things that need to be done, there needs to be, uh, those must be brought together in different proportions. Um, it does not mean that uh, a reserve force uh, a member now all of a sudden is, uh, how can I put it, can claim the same rights and everything as a regular, unless they are um, in service at that point in time. Put it this way, um, the, the person serves up to a particular point on a full-time basis. And after that, that person can, on a volunteer basis, allocate X number of days that they are prepared to uh, dedicate to the defense force, if the defense force requires those services. So the reservist cannot impose himself or herself on the, on the department, on the, on the SNDF, if their services are not required. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. So the one force concept says, once these are in operation, um, they operate as a, a, a unit and there cannot be any discrimination in any way. They, have, um, they are protected, they, give, they are given the same, they are entitled to um, uh, training, they're entitled to the uniform, they're entitled to same equipment and, and all of those things. Um, but um, the amount of uh, time that they are spending uh, in defense operation is at the total, is absolute discretion of the department or of the ACNDF. So, um, in fact, um, you know, given what we have, the kind of challenges that we have, we actually need more them. We need them more. Uh, but regrettably, their the mandates have been reduced um, substantially. So, that is um, just a pity. But from the one force concept point of view, it is in terms of making sure that um, once you have them as um, in a particular group, they are doing the same job, they have the same benefits and so on. However, um, in terms of uh, promotions, um, they, uh, they, I mean, the, the departmental uh, policy will apply there. There was an issue about a bloated structure which the minister referred to. Bloated in the sense of um, there are, in other words, that what that means is that um, you have more uh, leaders than you actually need. Put it this way, uh, the ratio between um, the number of soldiers vis-a-vis -vis one general uh, is out of proportion. So you will have, in other words, the general ratio, uh, the general uh, troop ratio uh, is too small. Um, so you have, um, there, there'll be a difference between one general having a hundred soldiers and another one general having two soldiers. So the, in the second scenario, you have, you, you, you are too top heavy, if you catch what I'm saying because it means for four soldiers, we'll need two generals. Whereas in the other scenario, you'll have, well, if you have one soldier, one general for 100 soldiers, and it will mean you'll have two generals for 200 soldiers. So that one will not be too top heavy compared to this one. It, it talks to, to that. So we'll need to quantify that for the size of a defense force that we have relative to the comparable defense forces out there. And then you can decide if really we, um, there is um, that, that, uh, the, is that a fact or not, or it is fiction. Ms. Maria asked a question in the presentation, why do we have against the name of, of um, the chief SNTF as incumbent? And um, under, we say age when leaving office, incumbent age limit exceeded, and when we say not applicable. Uh, I think it, it is self-explanatory because the general is still, uh, has not left office, so he's still incumbent. And um, is, uh, the age limit uh, been exceeded uh, when leaving office, uh, he has not left the office as yet. Um, so that, that is uh, uh, 
as basic as that. Ms. Raida uh, uh, also touched on the issue of um, um, uh, so many generals as per service commission um, input, many generals are retiring. Um, do we have enough um, bodies to, re uh, to replace them? Uh, based on what um, Chief HR presented at the uh, beginning of this year, um, uh, I think we do. Um, I think we do because um, if you look at the numbers, um, Chair, uh, I indicated that uh, as at that time for major generals and rear admirals, 48% of them were, were seen to be stagnating um, and also on the verge of leaving. But just behind them, uh, just before that, uh, the, the, the age group 50 to 54, you still have um, a number of people in, in, that, in, um, uh, in that category. And even 45 to 49. So we have bodies for that. Uh, uh, in and our kennels, um, between, you have kennels uh, between uh, 40 and 49. Um, and uh, uh, those, those kennels are on the other side of 200. Uh, between the ages 50 to 54 is uh, about 300. So um, uh, I would argue that we have uh, numbers there. The challenge is um, the right people for the right position. Um, so that will be the, the matching, uh, what Mr. Robinson was talking about, getting people in the right seats in the bus. Um, uh, I think uh, we've discussed the issue of the fluidity of re regular uh, vessels, uh, um, the reserves. I don't think I should comment on that. Now, there is an issue about the shortage of funds for, for, for the reserve of forces, which is regrettable that uh, Mr. Shalembe, um, Honorable Shalembe raised. Um, uh, that is regrettable. Um, uh, when I look at the reduction in men days for, for reserve forces, um, the issue of MSDS uh, being done every second year, um, I, I look at those as, uh, well, that is my own interpretation, which might be incorrect, is that, um, you know, the department had to take certain decisions in order to get uh, within the envelope allocated for the cost of employees. And they had to make drastic changes in the operating model, uh, which will have had to, uh, where reprioritization had to happen. And part of that um, would impact on the reserve forces, would impact on the MSDS and so on. It's not ideal environments because we need more reserve uh, mandates. We need more uh, frequent and larger numbers of MSDS if we have to have a credible feeder system. So uh, I looked at those as um, uh, temporary interventions in order to get under the ceiling that is allocated uh, for the um, HR budget. Um, the issue of rejuvenation that the Honorable Mutla raised. Now, it takes, um, as um, um, uh, the prof indicated, it takes X number of years for a particular rank group to progress to the next one because of uh, the causes that have to be done. Um, uh, honorable members, uh, we have to be very careful on this one. We have to be very careful. Uh, these people are dealing with lives uh, of people. So that means um, they need to undergo proper and thorough training um, uh, because with better training, lives are saved. So you will not um, advise um, a situation where uh, uh, probably corners have to be cut because we might have more body bags coming back. It might sound very counter, um, progressive, but uh, it is a reality. Uh, our soldiers have to be have to undergo these different causes for purposes of making sure that the mission can be accomplished and that lives can be saved. Uh, I'm talking now on forces. 
So, however, if you have a, a smooth running uh, feeder system, as I already indicated, not done every second year, but every year, but also in larger quantums, uh, you stand a better chance of having a sufficient material uh, for promotion um, at that level because, because in any case, at entry point, you have an oversubscription. You have posts for 500 people and um, um, applications will be on the other side of 50,000, 10,000 or whatever number. So you always oversubscribe, which means um, uh, if the system of of getting our MSDS rolled out properly. You will always have younger people better uh, 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 attuned to, to the task. That will definitely result in the rejuvenation of our general staff. Um, the issue of our veterans um, um, uh, that uh, Mr. Uh, Honorable Mutsamai raised, uh, the prof is already touched on that. Lastly, as it relates to conscription, Chair, uh, uh, it is a very sensitive matter. Sensitive uh, in the sense that uh, um, one, um, conscription is not politically uh, acceptable as a principle, which is why we have a volunteer system. Two, uh, professionalization, um, uh, professionalizing the defense force requires that people participate on a volunteer basis. It is in line with the, our constitution and anything that goes counter to that will, be, will not be acceptable from a constitutional perspective. But um, thirdly, um, it has got this thing of, uh, uh, I think Mr. Mr. Robinson, um, we, we always oversubscribed. So whether, in other words, you're not going to have to force anybody to, 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 to get on board because we have a, a social economic situation that we have. But unfortunately, uh, we have a, a professional defense force and that has that relies on um, a volunteer system. The uh, youth development um, or youth, uh, youth service that was noted in the uh, defense review, uh, unfortunately, it does not seem to have um, take, um, um, taken any traction um, the way as it was originally envisaged. Um, but in terms of the law, the minister has all the powers to create um, any service um, as may be required, whether it is an auxiliary service or a youth service or this or whatever service that might be required. I don't think that is the issue. The issue is what is what is the size of the envelope that will enable the chief of the defense force to play around in terms of getting more people on, on board, whether um, by way of increasing MSDS or not. That is the issue. So it is an it, it is a financial issue at the end of the day. That would be my input, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doc. Nkomose, uh, I, I see your hand. Um, uh, before I come to you, uh, Mr. Robinson, is this a legacy or is a new hand? No, Chair, it's not a legacy, it's a new hand. Okay, let me take you, Nkomose, um, okay. uh, and, uh, and then go to Mr. Robinson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to comment on one issue which was raised by uh, Honorable Mare around the issue of um, uh, consultation or the, the succession within the reserve force. Now, we noted that um, the challenges are similar between the permanent and the reserve force component. However, in this instance, we focused on the permanent members because that's where the majority of the concerns and um, concerns were raised, uh, but I, I must note that the, we, we did note the need for a specific uh, investigation into the reserve force members because as much as the, the challenges are similar, 
they are very uh, the, the challenges within within the reserve force are unique because even the manner in which their career management and so forth, all of those other uh, issues that you spoke about around defense force, I mean, around the reserve, uh, it's a bit of a, of a different situation when compared to the permanent members. So uh, the long and short of it is that we concentrated, yes, we concentrated on the permanent members. However, we've noted the need to actually look specifically at uh, reserve force related challenges around succession. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thank you very much, uh, Makoban, uh, Mr. Robertson. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chair. Just a, a quick one. I think uh, some of the questions that were uh, <clears throat> raised uh, for the commission have been dealt with. Some, some are out of our scope, uh, but they've been dealt with by the prof and, and the doc. Um, Mr. Magabani has uh, responded to one issue. Then there, then there was, uh, I'm not sure who it was, raised the issue of what, raised the point of what were the issues that when we visit, some of the issues when we visited bases, um, what were some of the issues? Uh, from the top of my head, I can say many of them were HR related issues, career pathing, um, Discipline issues. Mr. Magabani can list a whole range of them, if we, if if, we, if the person wants to. Um, <clears throat> it was around uh, base security. It was around accommodation. It was around duty buses. Uh, many of the issues we've uh, put in a document uh, that's come before the, uh, the committee a number of times and with the minister. But I don't know whether Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Magabani wants to add, but those, I can't remember who raised that issue. But thank you, Chair. Okay. All right. Uh, colleagues, I think um, we have exhausted all the, 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 the comments. Um, it left for me to thank uh, all the presenters uh, uh, tonight. And uh, we, we um, I'm really grateful. I think I speak on behalf of, of the committee and um, that we, we had this, uh, this uh, presentations. Um, <clears throat> when you have so much information, um, it's very difficult to say um, on uh, what you are going to do uh, with it. Uh, without um, you know carefully going through every single note that you, you took um, we will certainly uh, follow uh, through um, if at some point maybe we determine that we need uh, uh, to call you back on just to uh, <clears throat> on a you know to address us on a, a particular aspect or a particular topic. I'm sure it will always be uh, available, readily available to come and uh, address us. And uh, some information, uh, we will uh, put it into our own uh, program, convert it into, uh, the, into a program of the committee and uh, place them as items for engagement with the uh, department. Uh, we are indeed concerned about the issues of, uh, of planning because um, uh, planning is not so much, uh, succession planning is not so much about the present. It's, 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 it's also about the, it's also about the future uh, of the defense uh, force. And um, uh, colleagues, let me then thank you uh, for your, your, your presentation and, and then say we have opened our, our eyes. Uh, you have highlighted matters that we, some of which were not as clear and, uh, and the such uh, could not um, uh, you know, um, look at them uh, during the past uh, three years as, as the committee. 
So thank you very much uh, for, for this. Uh, honorable Chair, uh, the co-chair, um, let me just check if we, the system has not kicked him out. Uh, Mr. Chabeleng, are you still in, in the meeting? It looks as though the system has uh, kicked him out. Colleagues, um, is it not the right time that I um, uh, attend the meeting? Uh, I know there's another item that we need to go through um, uh, after this uh, presentation. Uh, what, what was that item, Nadepa? Um, it's the minutes, Chair. Yes, uh, I, the minutes uh, are going to dampen uh, the spirit. I think we need to leave the meeting whilst uh, we are all, um, you know, uh, I think the presentations tonight uh, were so helpful that we need to start to digest um, them. Colleagues, uh, Mr. Yeah, Roberts, can I jump in then, please? You want to come in? All right. Please, Chair, if I may. Just uh, regarding the, the logistical arrangements, for those of us that are attending the event on Sunday, um, I am aware that I think there's three okay, or four of us. So can I release the team? Can I release the, the, them first, the presenters? Uh, thank Indeed. you so much. Mr. Robinson and, and the commissioners and the, the senior members of staff, thank you very much for uh, putting together a, a good presentation and uh, tonight and engaging and, and, and with, with the committee members. Uh, Prof uh, and uh, uh, Doc, we, we, Doc will recall that there are matters that he, he you know, uh, spoke to during our symposium and um, uh, some of them were, were dealing with, with them uh, just, uh, was it yesterday? Yeah, in, in our committee. He, during the, uh, uh, what do you call the, the uh, what do you call this now? Uh, what do you call this? During the, what do you call this, uh, Peter? Uh, com what is this forum that we had? Um, Colloquium, eh? Colloquium. <laughs> During the current colloquium, um, uh, uh, Dr. Kanye uh, commented on people who, or on, on officials who are on extended uh, suspension. And that is another error that, that is one other error that we need to, to look at. Uh, that matter was on the program of the committee just yesterday. So that's how we, we uh, uh, decipher issues and uh, put them in a programmatic way. Uh, Doc and uh, Prof, thank you very much for tonight's engagement. And I wish to thank everybody who was our guest and uh, was willing to share uh, his or her views with us. I thank uh, Admiral Kupi, the Chief of Staff, and other senior members of the Defense Force who were able to attend tonight. So you are then free to exit the platform at any time you, you wish so. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Uh, good night. Thank, Thank you, Prof. All right, colleagues. Um, yes, um, Mr. Ryder, let me come back to you. Um, um, Nandipa, you got the question. Um, the issue is the, the, the trip to, Pl to uh, Blomfontein. Um, yes, Chair, everything has been organized, Chair, but maybe by tomorrow, we're waiting for the travel agent to give us the, the numbers of the drivers so that the driver, we can, we can um, communicate the number to the two members, Mr. Ryder and Mr. Motamai. But everything has been, has been done. Everything is organized, Chair. Okay. So just so for the numbers. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that the trip, um, the, the, this trip was approved. Yes, Chair. Okay. No, no, it's fine. Mr. Mr. Raider, you, you still want to make a follow-up? Yeah, Chair, please, if I may. J just if we can get some sort of an idea. So, yes, the driver's numbers will obviously help us tremendously. Um, I have booked my flights already. But uh, just to get an idea, if there's a program out 
um, or, or some details of the venue um, in case, for example, if the drivers go astray sometime. If we can just get a little bit more detail, I'd be most grateful for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Hey, Nandipa? Um, they haven't sent us the program, but um, I will request the program tomorrow morning, Chair. Okay. And, and, and all and the relevant details, um, uh, the, the time uh, and the news and uh, all that so that uh, uh, members um, go there knowing exactly what to expect um, in case, uh, you know, there is uh, someone get lost and is able to know where to retrace um, uh, the steps. And any other? Doesn't look like there's any other comment. Colleagues, I, I will not deal with the minutes tonight. I, we, we can deal with them at, uh, on, uh, on any other day, maybe the next uh, meeting of the portfolio committee. Colleagues, are you happy that I attend the meeting at this point? Do you agree? Yes, no uh, problem. I agree, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. All right, colleagues, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and, uh, and Nandipa and other colleagues in the support team. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good night. Yeah. Thank yes, you. Good night, Chair. Good night, Chair. Good, good night, night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Commissioner Tseko. Come uh, some my fair, fair, fair enough. Okay, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>